good day, everyone, and welcome to the third and final installment of the ninth annual Analytics Summit, virtual edition, brought to you by the University of Cincinnati's Center for Business Analytics, a part of the Lindner School, uh, College of Business. I'm Glenn Wagren. I'm the executive director of the center, and together with uh, Dr. Mike Fry, the center's academic director, and uh, the center staff. Uh, we're all delighted to be able to bring to you a part of a live event, uh, which has really become a must-attend event uh, here in Cincinnati uh, for business leaders, uh, analytic practitioners, students, and faculty to meet, hear, see, and learn about the successes and the challenges to drive value in the practical application of analytics across industries and disciplines. Now, as I mentioned, we're honored to have several Tableau Zen Masters join us today to address our theme, Visualizing Unexpected Events. Now, with us today are Steve Wexler from Data Revelations, Chloe Seng from Viz for Social Good, and Chantilly Jagannath from Lovelytics as our speakers. Now, following a similar format as in our previous webinars, We'll first meet each of these speakers, say, hello, say hi to them, I'll let them say hi to you, and then, uh, then we'll turn the mic over to them for their presentation, and then we're gonna follow that with a Q&A from the audience. Um, now we're gonna wrap up uh, the event with a panel discussion uh, with our three speakers, and we'll also have Jeff Schaefer from Unifund um, join us. So uh, if this all sounds good to you, then, uh, then let's, let's get things started here. So the first, uh, first speaker up is uh, Steve Wexler. Um, so Steve is the, uh, the founder of Data, Data Revelations, and he's the co-author with Jeff Schaefer uh, of the Big Book of da Dashboards, Visualizing Your Data Using Real-World Business Scenarios. Uh, Steve's worked with many corporations, consultancies, and universities to help them understand and visualize their data. Uh, Steve's a five-time Tableau Zen master, He's an Iron Viz champion, and he's also on the advisory board to the Data Visualization Society. Okay, well, sorry about that. So why should I trust you? And why trust and integrity in data visualization is critical. And I hope a lot of people recognize this face. That's Walter Cronkite. He was the anchor for the CBS Evening News from 1962 to 1981 and he was also known as the most trusted man in America. He helped explain to the nation what was going on during a period of, of at the time, unprecedented upheaval, wars, assassinations, demonstrations. He ended every broadcast with the catchphrase, and that's the way it is. He related facts to people in a way that they craved. Well, I don't have to tell anyone who's watching this that we're also in a period of upheaval. And I want to cite these two people. I suspect the person on the right is um, recognized by more people who are watching than the person on the left. Well, who's the person on the left? That is Dr. Uh, Bonnie Henry, and she is the Chief Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia. On the right is Andrew Cuomo, the Governor of New York. And I have not been watching what uh, Dr. Henry has been doing, but for probably two months, Cuomo's daily briefings were must-see TV. He was insistent on presenting facts, 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 and uh, I remember taking a screen share, of, a screen capture of this. It so impressed me um, when he said, look, you want to blame somebody? Blame me for the decisions that were being made. Um, but it was helpful to get timely information, find out what was happening, seeing the graphs and charts, not that they were all perfect or wonderful, but he engendered a huge amount of trust during this particularly critical period, I'd say from the end of March until the end of May. This is Brian Kemp. He is the governor of Georgia. And why am I bringing this up? Because in the middle of May, uh, this kind of hit my Twitter feed a lot. The governor of Georgia did not arrange COVID-19 data in chronological order to make it appear that cases are decreasing. Realize this is not just on the website. He had a huge press conference and he showed this chart 
and it inflamed a lot of people. I ended up following Kine, who is a drag performer and does incredible videos explaining difficult mathematical concepts. She does what these TikTok uh, where this drag performer does this TikTok videos. And I just want to note, I've avoided making vids about COVID-19, but this blunder is just too big to ignore. In any case, well, what's the blunder? What? I don't see a problem. If cases are decreasing, that's great. Well, look at the x-axis, the sacrosanct x-axis. May 9th, May 8th, May 3rd, April 26th, May 7th. A kind of a rule of timeline or time series charts is you go from left to right, from newest, excuse me, from oldest to newest. And this is breaking this. This is not going from oldest to newest. This is going from highest to lowest. So of course it's going to be decreasing. Not surprisingly, the press was pretty upset about this. This is from the New York Post, Georgia Department of Health slam for misleading coronavirus data. This comes from the Financial Times, when axes get truly evil. Within days, Brian Kemp had to apologize after Georgia website incorrectly showed downward trend. And this is Dr. Kathleen Toomey. She is the um, Georgia Department of Public Health Commissioner head of the health department, and who's quoted as saying, the integrity of Georgia's coronavirus data is absolute top priority. We're gonna be transparent. We're gonna provide much better data to you. It's essential that we do this. So this was on May 21st. On May 30th, I decided to look at the website and see what, if anything, has improved. You know, you, you are entitled to make a mistake, although it was something this important, I question that, whether you know you can afford to make a mistake. But in any case, it's now nine days later. Let's take a look at the site. And I started looking for that graph. The first thing I saw was this, which is kind of hard to figure out what's going on. Um, the very spiky blue line, those are daily confirmed cases. And they're spiky because it's hard to report these things on a daily basis. There may be a lag in it and go, oh, two days, so we're reporting two days of data on a particular day, hence the orange line or dots, which are trying to show the seven-day moving average. And it looks like it's increasing and then going down, it's increasing. And then what do we have over here? I have a bunch of dots that don't have a line connected to them. There's this demarcation point of May 17th. And what is that point? If you read about it, it means all this data is preliminary. All these dots going down, we don't know if that data is, is correct or not. Shortly after finding this chart, I found this chart. By the way, what it's attempting to show is the top five counties for cases over a period of time. And yes, look at this. It is in chronological order. Very glad to see that. But look where May 17th is. So they just indicated in the other chart that everything after May 17th is preliminary. So this thing showing stuff going down, this is all preliminary. At this point, I was absolutely exasperated and decided to, well, let me look at the data myself. And I went to the New York Times and got the same data that they make available. I double checked it with the COVID-19 hub from Tableau. By the way, both of these things are fueled with data from uh, Johns Hopkins. In any case, both data sets agreed and I decided to visualize this on my own. And Cases are not going down. Cases are, in fact, increasing. Oh, let's say thank you. So, well, that begs another question, which is, should we even be looking at cases? Or should we be looking at the percentage of tests that come back positive? I mean, obviously, if you test more, you're going to have more cases. But if you're testing a lot and you're getting a lot of positives, what does that mean? Or should we be looking at hospitalizations? Or should we be looking at deaths? And even back in, in April, beginning of April, uh, Nate Silver wrote saying coronavirus case counts are meaningless. So two days ago, I decided to look at the site. And is there useful information that's going to help me navigate what's going on? Remember, the government is asking a lot of people at this point. And I have 
what is this chart here? Oh, it's cases by county. And it goes from light blue to dark blue and suddenly jumps to red. And what is this chart here? Oh, this is the replacement chart for showing the top five counties. I defy you to understand what's going on in that chart. I'm a professional chart looker at her, and I can't understand what's going on here. My reaction to this is kind of that. Uh, a few days ago, Anna Ford, a colleague of, of my colleagues that are here, uh, tweeted that she had stumbled upon this website, which comes from Kelly Cronert, who is just a not a doctor. She's not a data visualization specialist. She does have a strong technical and scientific background. And she produced this site mostly to deal with her own anxiety. And yeah, there's some problems with it, and I haven't fully vetted uh, every chart and every graph, but it is so much more useful than the official uh, Georgia Department of Health site. I'm getting much better insights and explanations of what's going on from this person who was just exasperated with what the government is supposed to be providing. Well, what does all of this have to do you know, with you and people who are looking to get into this, either to produce visualizations or possibly to, um, if you do, look, if you're producing it, you absolutely have to be thinking about this. But I'd like you to at least be a very enlightened consumer. Well, I want to cite an example that goes back three years ago. There's a wonderful social media initiative called Makeover Monday. It was founded initially by Andy Kriebel, one of our colleagues, Andy Cotgreave, ran it with him for a while. Andy Cotgreave is uh, another one of the authors of the Big Book of Dashboards. Eva Murray and Charlie Hutchinson are now running it. It is a great opportunity to learn how to practice your craft. The idea behind it is there's a visualization that's been out in the wild that's published by a magazine, news article, website, whatever. And then there's the data that drives that. And then the community is welcome to take that same data and see if they can come up with a better visualization or maybe a some different facet of the data. So beginning of 2017, this was the particular data set. Here is something that first appeared in the website Women's Agenda. The article also appeared in Forbes Australia. And what does it say? Australia's 50 highest paying jobs are paying men significantly more. The data set was out in the wild, on your mark, get set, go, and people started showing this egregious gap between what people were making, men were making in certain pr professions versus what women were making in certain professions. And we started seeing charts like this and this, and this, and this, a lot of gap charts or barbell charts or connected dot plots, whatever words you want to have for them. I'll confess, I don't really know how to read this chart, but what shocked me and shocked Jeff Schaefer, we both were, were upset about this, was no alarm bells were going off. This was the data that people were pointing out, that the, um, uh, a male, ophthalmologist is making 552,000 and a woman ophthalmologist is making 217,000. Ophthalmologists were cited first because it's where the biggest gap was in all of these uh, professions. And, and what, here's the data that was used. Hey, it comes from the government tax site. Look at something in particular. Average taxable income. And th this brings up one of my favorite drawings. Um, it comes from Ben Orlin, who's written a wonderful book called Math with Bad Drawings. What would my starting salary be? Well, I'll put it this way. On our average starting salary is $80,000. And you discover you and your coworkers are all making $30,000. And the CEO's son is making $430,000. Look, just seeing average was enough for me, realizing you just need one outlier. Someone who's on retainer with the Sultan of Brunei for $25 million, and that will totally skew the data. Uh, my uh, friend, colleague, and co-author Jeff Schaefer went quite a bit further than I did, and he started digging into workforce statistics in Australia. Anyone who knows Jeff would not be surprised by this. 17% of the male workforce in Australia is working part-time, 46% of female work Course was working part time in um, healthcare, and this is a, a government study. 85% of, of part time workers were female. 
And Jeff found kind of a mother load, this survey of male and female ophthalmologists by the Society of Ophthalmology in Australia. And here are the key findings. And the big one is 57.5% of females work part-time compared with 13.6% for males. So welcome to reality. It's time for the facts. And in looking at that particular survey by Dunn of 254 ophthalmologists, the gap was $38,000 Australian, not $335,000. That is still a big gap, but it's only almost 10 times less than what the article claimed. The problem with this is it now numbs people. They go, oh, it's only $38,000. What's the big deal? That is a big deal. But because you had people amplifying this thing that was huge, it now doesn't seem like such a big deal. And the thing that most bothered me was we had 100 of our best and brightest people out there in data visualization amplifying something that was just plain wrong and would hate to see something like this happening. Oh, you think the wage gap in the U.S. is uh, bad? You should see what it's like in Australia. Just the other day, I was looking at this really cool infographic. Well, there were 100 cool infographics going on at the same time with that. So what bothered me was we were kind of, you know, design sense was trumping common sense. And I'm starting to see this again. Well, we see this all the time, but I'm much more concerned about a wage gap. And it's the rush to visualize data. And I'm not going to show this example. I'll just cite it. In early March, something kind of hit the Twitter feed. Someone who was well-meaning um, was looking at, oh, there's so few cases of COVID-19 and there are so many cases of the flu and this person had a little dot showing, uh, look how small COVID is compared with the flu. We're really blowing all this stuff out of proportion and kind of had the temerity to quote Hans Rosling about the importance of, of facts over fear. And it, it fortunately, a lot of people said, you know, here's why you can't compare these things. You can't compare them at this point. And um, I was really admonishing colleagues at the time, um, unless you know what you're doing, unless you're an expert in this, you may be doing some damage here at this point. You know, data hasn't been vetted. Um, be very careful before you start visualizing things. And I recognize people want to get a handle on it. They want to share their information. The same thing is happening around systemic racism throughout the world and particularly in the United States. And I'm seeing people rush to do work, some of which has been great. And I'm, I'm going to cite this example. It's from Ryan McGinnis. And uh, it's a very powerful visualization. Police killings of Black Americans in the U.S. from 2013 to 2019. We have this histogram here. Um, and then each of these dots, it kind of mirrors the histogram. I think this is called a, a Wilkinson dot plot. Um, the item scrolls down and allows you to inspect each of the, these things and also discover, despite all these killings, a purple shot those shows where an officer was convicted. But here, here was my concern about this was take a look at this thing that says 70% were 25 or younger, trying to make this point that lies being taken away. That's not correct. It's in fact 35%, and Ryan was very quick to, 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 to fix this, but if the stakes are high, you can't afford to be wrong with this stuff. People are going to deny systemic racism exists, and they will do anything uh, to find evidence that the numbers are fake. You can't be wrong with stuff that is this important. Look, you're going to make mistakes, so um, what can you do to minimize them? Well, I hope you all recognize these three people. That's Jeff Schaefer, that's Andy Cotcreed, that's on the right is Amanda McCulloch. These are my chums in chart chat, the people that I do the monthly chart chat program. And why do I trust these people? Because I see how seriously they take their work and vetting their visualization before they publish it. And I showed you an example of Jeff going the extra mile and with the data, but from time to time, each one of these people will say, I'm, you know, I'm planning to publish this. Can you look at it before I do? And they usually ask two or three people. 
I asked them the same thing. You know, we have large amplifiers at this point, meaning people are following us. It's important that we get this right, and you need to do the same thing. Well, you know, think about what's being, government has asked all of us to sacrifice for the greater good. How long will you continue to do this? And in less than a year's time, you may be asked to take a vaccine. Are you going to take it? These are big ass and big decisions. And I'm thinking, well, it depends on who's going to tell me it's okay to take this vaccine. You know, am I going to trust the people who have consistently engendered trust? Or, you know, I'm, I'd be a little wary to look at some of the things, you know, examples that I've cited at the moment. Also realize we are all amplifiers. When you retweet something, when you post a link to an article or a post, so anything that you've read, you are amplifying something. And it's important that you make sure you're amplifying things that are factual and correct. Well, I've been talking about trust and integrity. Um, uh, I want to discuss a little bit about values. And uh, Glenn, you did ask me about um, anything egregious. And I'm going to share with you what I think is the most egregious thing that I've seen in the last two, three months. Um, and it falls under the category of, should I be visualizing this? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the next graphic may make some people uncomfortable, and you should be uncomfortable with this. Um, Fox News decides to look at certain absolutely horrifying events in the history of the United States related to race, Martin Luther King's uh, assassination, Rodney King acquittal, Michael Brown death in St. Louis, and most recently, the George Floyd murder. And looking at the stock bump a week after each of these events. And, you know, we, we beat up on Fox News for, you know, truncating the value axes and not starting it at zero. They got this chart just right. Everything is fine. But who even thinks to look at events this way? Yeah, the data is right, but why are you visualizing this? Realize somebody wanted this graph, somebody made this graph, somebody approved the graph, and then somebody spoke about it at length in front of millions of people. And, and it, 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 it got a question, is this something that you want to amplify? Is this the values that you want to amplify? So the, of all the things I've, I've seen, I think this would be the most egregious. So I'm going to ask you, who are you going to be as you have data and you can relate it to other people. You know, I think of Walter Cronkite, I think of Hans Rosling, and I think we you know, would desperately wish both of these voices were here now. Uh, Hans Rosling, especially being an expert on, on global health and would have really sound ideas on how to do this. If someone asks you to take a vaccine, is it Dr. Bonnie Henry, is it Anthony Fauci, is it Andrew Cuomo? And my hope, for anyone that's doing this or is thinking of doing it, please think critically about the data. Don't just visualize it. Be someone others can trust. You will be invaluable to your organization and you will be invaluable to your community. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Wow. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, that's um, there's some food for thought right there. Um, boy, have I got questions. Um, you know, I was I was thinking about this over the weekend about um, you know the, uh, the I'm reading about vaccines um, and the development of them, and that so, there's so many so many people who are out developing vaccines, um, how do you know what's what's real and what what isn't? And it and it and as I was thinking about today's webinar, um, the whole idea of just visualizing information, um, it certainly seems to me similar to even vaccine development, peer review, um, 
something that is a, a journal quality information that you're sharing that is potentially going to be impacting so many. So I, I think your your idea of vetting your visualizations is is synonymous with having a peer review of what it is that you're about ready to share and and potentially amplify um, and getting a lot of eyeballs on. Um, so that's you know kudos to you to bring that up. Um, Hans Rosling, God bless his soul. Uh, uh, what a what a great man! And I'm glad you brought him up as well as 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 Uncle Walt uh, as well. <laughs> um, uh, have you? I don't know. I assume you follow Tufty. Um, any has he been weighing in on on this space as well too? And and how? You know, really, you so, so, so this is this is there's a part of me which is laughing right now because I know what Jeff. I think I know what Jeff Schaefer is thinking. Yeah. I am one. I am in the club of uh, exalted people who have been banned from following Tufty. <laughs> um, um, and and I was very proud to to enter that. Alberto Cairo, Jonathan Schwabish, a bunch of other people. Um, so no, I have no idea what he's weighing in and saying because I'm not allowed to follow him on Twitter. Um, and and I'm not exactly sure what I did. Uh, the only thing I can think is years ago I wrote a blog post called Sparkline Schmarklines uh, because I thought sparklines were being misused. I like sparklines. I use them. Um, and I guess um, you know, I, it, given you know the the workshop that I attended of his and other things, I know it doesn't surprise me that uh, he has banished me from following him. I'm, I'm I'm sorry to hear that because I as as you talk about these things, uh, particularly you know just because you can do something with visualization, should you? It, it just yeah, it's it's about chart junk and it's about you know over over uh, glamifying um, a visualization and missing the whole point that a visualization is supposed to help with better decision making, and that's really the core of it. And if you're not focused on What's the decision that you're trying to enable, or the insight specifically that you're really trying to to demonstrate? It's they're, they're, Glenn, it's interesting because what is being done internally for making decision making, and sometimes what is being done to have an emotional impact, like that Ryan McGinnis thing, was was well. Did you need to have the separate dots and see how few purple ones there were? And he wanted to have something which had um, an emotional component for a general audience. Um, Lindsay Poulter had a, a, a very powerful visualization, which was showing the Fortune 500 as a grid, as a waffle chart, something I would normally not recommend people use. Um, and it was ranked from first to 500th, and a total of five of the squares were uh, colored purple, indicating that, okay, the chief executive officer is black versus the other 495. And is this a chart that you would normally use in internal communication? Probably not. But um, this, do I need to make an exact comparison? I don't. Do I need to get people to realize just how skewed this is? Yes. And it had a, a, an emotional impact. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, my colleagues know I'm, I'm, Make this as simple as possible. Use the simplest chart type. Uh, ask, you know, the the make it as clear as possible um, for the largest number of people. Provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. But there are some ex exceptions to that. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Well, um, and uh, interest of time here, we want to move move along, and uh, um, I'm going to ask Mike. Uh, Mike, are you there? There's I am here. Um, any questions coming on in, or do you have any questions? Well, we do. We've got some questions coming in, and I'll just remind the audience to type in a question. You won't actually see questions typed in by others, but we're aggregating all these, and we'll pass them on verbally to the speakers. Um, so, Steve, I've got a very simply stated question that might be a challenge to answer that came from the audience, and the question is this. How can we make sure that the data we are presenting are correct? The of things that um, keep me up at night, that's one of them. You know, that that uh, I indicated that I went to the same data set that the New York Times is using um, and tried to corroborate it with 
the data from the COVID hub. And suppose that's wrong. You know, everything, you know, the, you know part of this is, okay, these organizations have engendered trust. Um, um, I would recommend that everybody get a copy of uh, Avoiding Data Pitfalls by Ben Jones. Um, it goes way beyond just the visualizing the data, but realizing all the flaws that can possibly be uh, in your data set. And study with people who will help you avoid this. Uh, Jeff Schaefer is absolutely um, brilliant at uh, uncovering where a lot of these flaws may be. But yeah, I worry about that all the time. So a related question, Steve. Um, so should we, as possibly people who do data visualization, should we be visualizing data for things where we are not a subject matter expert? And how can we mitigate some of the challenges of that? The, the you know, I, I know that's probably going to be some of the panel discussion on this, and I have some thoughts on it, but with yours and Glenn's uh, permission, I think I'll, I'll, I'll defer to when we, uh, um, Jeff runs that along with Chloe and, and Chantilly. Okay, yep. Um, so let's see, so we've got a couple of other questions coming in. Uh, let me ask you this one. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about storytelling uh, with data. We even teach classes related to storytelling. Jeff Schaefer teaches you know, our students about storytelling with data. So how, when obviously when storytelling, you choose to emphasize certain things and de emphasize other things and trying to communicate a visualization or a story to your audience, how can we make sure that we're not going too far in that and then not explaining as you showed in some of the examples, for instance, the part-time versus full-time differentiation in the data, how do we balance simple visualizations with kind of the whole full picture of what the data presents? The um, with great difficulty, you know, there's, you know, don't you know, um, figuring out what to show and how to show it is an ongoing pursuit. Um, and the, the, I've thought a lot about, well, what do you use dashboards for? Um, why do you need a dashboard? Aren't you just going to be giving a presentation or, or curating findings? And there are a lot of great reasons to have a dashboard, but one reason is something that will accelerate your ability to find something important in the data. So I happen to believe a dashboard, it's fine if a dashboard is boring, the presentation around that should be riveting. So what are you going to show? How are you going to show it? And how are you going to make your case and make sure that you're, you're being uh, honest and trustworthy and your values and integrity are in place? But also you can have the dashboard available for somebody wants to explore some other nuance or something that maybe you didn't think was as important. Um, you, you can do so. But um, also you know, the, the making sure you, know, you said that, look, look at the difference between uh, part-time versus full-time workers and men versus women. Uh, that's happening here. Um, having your sources, making sure, you know, when you have a visualization, here's the data, here's the source, this is what I cited, does a lot to show your integrity. You know, show that, hey, I'm not just making this stuff up, this is where I got the data from. Thanks. Uh, another question from the audience. So, from your perspective, in which domain or industry do you think data, data visualization has the ability to make the most impact? Oh, I'm, I'm, the, the answer is yes, all of them. I don't know any place that, that, that you can't shine better light by finding a great visualization that has people going, aha. I mean, you know, the, the big book of dashboards was a celebration of that. Um, the next book I'm working on is a celebration of that. It is, it's amazing what, with the right visualization, visualization done the right way, a whole bunch of stuff that's obscure uh, suddenly comes to light and can move people, can change people's behavior, can change an entire organization. And actually, there's a part B to this question, which is in which domain or industry do you think data visualization has the most impact for negative consequences if done poorly? Um, oh, gosh, news. <laughs> news organizations, for sure. Uh, communications. Um, oh, you know, everything, you know, the, 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 one of the uh, best-selling books of the 1950s was, you know, How to Lie with Statistics. One of the best books I've read the last two years is How Charts Lie by Alberto Cairo. So without a doubt, the news industry is the one that can uh, do, uh, I think, the most damage or, any, well, any, you know, hey, we're going to, we're going to 
we're going to lie with this chart to get this drug approved that shouldn't be. You know, we were talking about, you know, possibly killing people. So this will be the last one from the audience. This is actually from one of our statistics faculty members. And again, if you, if you think this is best deferred to the panel discussion, we can do that. But the question is, what do you think is the best way to visualize uncertainty? Um, boy, there have been, been um, uh, great articles on this and great examples of it. Uh, error bars, fuzziness, things like that. Um, it's rarely conveyed. You see survey results and you rarely see, hey, it could be as low as this, as high as this. Um, um, and so, you know, getting that idea across. Look, you know, um, uh, there are more better people who are thinking about this than I am. Um, I'm going to recommend um, Professor Matt Kay um, in Michigan um, uh, did a whole presentation on how you get um, mere mortals to understand uncertainty um, and relate to it and realize, oh, there's only a 23% chance of so-and-so winning this election. Well, how could it be this person won the election? Well, let's show it this way and go, oh, there's actually a pretty good chance of ending up uh, that happening, coming up with ways for people that are not steeped in the subject matter to understand it. Had a, uh, it was only a 20-minute presentation. It had a profound effect on me. Yeah, I think, you know, just from my personal experience, I've been amazed at the number of COVID-19 visualizations that actually remove the error bars from what's taken from the University of Washington. Is <laughs> it really dang? And, and, and look, I'll, I'll say, you know, one more thing. We have a, co a society that I think may actually understand log scales now uh, because of all the, um, so, you know, we got them to understand log scales. I hope maybe we can get them to understand error bars as well. That's probably the most optimistic thing I've heard. So uh, <laughs> I think we can we can end on that one. Uh, so Glenn, I will turn it back over to you. Mike, Thanks, Glenn, Steve. thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Steve, and, and don't go away. Uh, you're going to be back with us in a little bit with our panel discussion. So uh, so that that was fantastic. Great way to start off today's uh, webinar.